to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind. All just... right, all right, all right, all right, whatever. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, spending this uh, Thursday evening with us. I want to get started. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Daniel Baumgartner. Uh, everybody knows me as Mr. B. I'm the Theater Conservatory Director here at the National School of the Arts. Uh, I'm so excited to have you guys with us tonight. Um, this is one of, if not my favorite things that we have done over the last couple of years. We were unable to do this last year, so you're going to see some um, plays written by some of our, our upperclassmen, uh, which is really exciting. I opened it up to as many people as wanted to submit their plays. Um, but this is a, just a really, really fun way to not only celebrate our students' work that, that they have worked so hard on throughout the year, but also kind of show them what it's like to work a little bit more professionally as a playwright um, uh, in terms of going from the initial idea to the finished script to a published piece of work. Uh, there's always this sort of in between where there's workshopping, you're having as many people put eyes on these scripts as possible. Um, and, and you're doing things just like this. You're doing a staged table read. Uh, so in case you don't know what that means or what that is, um, a staged table read is just a way for a playwright to have their script read by actors and performed by actors. You're going to notice it's going to look a lot like a kind of like a radio play uh, where the actors don't have costumes. They don't have blocking. They're not moving around so much but they're emoting just as much as they would if they were actually performing this. Um, and they usually perform these in front of an audience. And then not only do you have the actors giving feedback on uh, these playwright scripts, but you have audience feedback and participation as well. So this is really one of the steps from taking a finished piece of work all the way to having it published. Um, if you know, if, if you follow theater at all, if you're a big fan of Hamilton and those sorts of things, Lin-Manuel Miranda did exactly this, uh, probably several times before Hamilton hit the Broadway stage. Uh, and so I'm so excited to introduce to you not only these really talented actors, but these really talented playwrights. Uh, you're going to hear from them all here very shortly. Um, before we get started, I just threw a really long, ugly link in the chat. Um, if you, uh, and I'll, I'll put it in there one more time, I'm going to be throwing it in every once in a while, uh, but if you check the chat on this Zoom call, you're going to see that link. If you click on that, it's going to take you to our program. Uh, oh, never mind. I look fine. Zoom's telling me that my internet is bad. I already knew that, Zoom. But you're going to see our program for tonight. Uh, it's going to have all the names. Uh, it, I wasn't able to put sort of a special thanks section in there like I normally would like to. So I do want to uh, do a couple of shout outs really quickly. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Ms. Olivia Schindler, who is here uh, tonight. She is our Thespian Honor Society president. There she is. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, and she uh, is is sort of the the head of the organization that put this on tonight. Our Thespian Honor Society is uh, first and foremost, an honor society, so it takes a little bit for our students to get uh, inducted into that honor society. Um, they have to participate with us in um, theatrical, the, the shows that we do, fundraisers that we do, that kind of stuff, but it's also a service organization. Um, Olivia can attest to this. We have done uh, uh, fundraisers for the, and, and we've taken donations for things like the, the tornado relief that happened last year. Uh, and, and we try to be as much a part of the community as possible. Um, now, Olivia, I know we had talked about this earlier. Is there anything that you want to say? I want to give you that chance if you, if you want to about what thespians is. Well, one thing that I've learned throughout, uh, being a thespian, uh, from my time in high school is that it's open to anybody at the school. It's not just in the theater conservatory. We have people from choir and dance in this in the Thespian Society. It's just anybody who's interested in theater, helping out the theater community and being a part of the uh, shows, activities, fundraisers that we do, as Mr. B talked about, like we helped out the, um, uh, our, uh, uh, <laughs> I was a part of this club too. Uh, Ms. Coward helped out. Uh, the, the Service and Learning Club. Service and Learning Club. We partnered with them and as he said, did stuff with the tornado relief. But yeah, it's, it's just a great way to get involved in your theater community at school and outside of it. So yeah. 
Awesome. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, and, and another big shout out to Olivia who just graduated yesterday. She's one of our graduating seniors. We're really going to miss her. Uh, we also have uh, another graduating senior uh, this uh, in, in our production, uh, two actually. We have two of them, uh, but you'll, you'll meet them a little bit later. Um, I do want to give a big thank you to all of our executive council members of our Thespian Honor Society. Uh, Cameron Hukasian, who is our uh, vice president, Raina Williams, who is our um, secretary, and Margot Boone, who is our treasurer. And you're going to see uh, some of their work even a little bit later uh, this evening. Uh, before we get started, but not to draw this out any further, uh, this is virtual. We've been here the whole year, okay? Uh, so there might be some bobbles, there might be some internet issues, there may be some animals that come into frame. Uh, if you will bear with us, we're going to give you the best possible show that we can tonight. Okay. Now, without any further ado, I want to introduce our very, very first show this evening. Uh, and that is going to be a show titled Closes at Nine by our very own Lytle Landers. And tonight, we are going to have two very special actors in her production. Uh, we are actually going to have Miss Olivia Schindler, who is subbing in for Marissa Burris. And Katie Moran. So if I can welcome those two to the screen. Uh, Lytle is having some issue with her uh, internet. Again, one of those bobbles. So I'm going to be reading her stage directions tonight. Later on, you're going to see the playwrights actually uh, reading their own stage directions. But I'm going to start with us tonight. Uh, so without further ado, I hope you enjoy Closes at Nine by Lytle Landers. Scene one, setting. Sophia's bedroom. A desk with a phone, paper, and books next to the door on stage right. A bed on the other side of the room with a small table and lamp next to it. A window is up stage center. On the bedside table, an alarm clock sits. A spotlight is fixed on it so the time is clearly visible. At rise, the stage is dim. It is the evening. The door opens and Sophia rushes in with books and a book bag in hand. She drops them on the floor and goes to the lamp, switching it on lighting the whole stage. The alarm clock shows 6.30 p.m. Sophia takes off her sweater and lays it neatly on her bed. She slips off her shoes and puts them next to the door. She turns to the heap of books scattered on the floor and begins to set them on her desk without a moment to lose, organizing them as she goes along. Science with the geometry book, English, French, and art. The phone rings. Sophia gets off the floor and dusts herself and picks up the phone. Hello? Lisa. Obviously. How are you? Used. I can't, Lisa. I need to finish my essay for English. She slowly sets the phone down on the desk quietly as she realizes Lisa has a long story to tell and puts the rest of her books on her desk. A few moments later, she holds the phone to her ear. Yeah, yeah, totally. Wait, where are you going? It closes at nine. You said you're leaving at eight. Takes an hour to get across town. Oh, just sitting in the parking lot, huh? <laughs> yes, yeah. See you tomorrow. She hangs up the phone, shakes her head, and sits down to start her work. A car driving past every once in a while is heard as she works. The alarm clock shows 7 p.m. The stage is quiet and awkward. Sophia sighs, finally a knock on the door. Yes? Dinner will be ready soon. Please get ready, Sophia. All right, after I finish writing, I'll be down in a bit. Mother opens the door and stands in the doorway. Please get ready. You're always late because of your work. You should mind your time better. Yes, mother. She shifts in her chair, stiffens, turns away from mother and continues writing. Mother sighs, exits and closes the door. Sophia slumps in her chair and stares at her books. The phone rings again. Sophia answers. Hello? Lisa, I already told you I can't come. What's the point anyway? You can't get inside. What are you gonna do, break in? Oh, well, then I'm definitely not going. Why would I help you break in? Because it's something I've never done before? I mean, I haven't. It's wrong. She looks at the clock across the room. It now says 7.45 p.m. When are you leaving again? All right. No reason. I'm not going to come. Just asking. You can wait for me all you want. Off stage. Sophia, dinner. It's pasta. That's my mom. I have to go, okay? Now, don't call me again, Lisa. I, I can't, I won't come tonight. All right, good night. Sophia hangs up and stares at it for a moment. She walks over to her sweater on the bed and puts it on, checking the clock. 
I'll be right down, mother. As Sophia walks over to the door, she spots the phone and pauses. She hesitates, then grabs her shoes and sits on the bed to put them on. As she puts on her shoes, she looks at her door one last time, turning off the lamp uh, on the stage, opens the window and climbs out. The only light left on is the one centering the clock. End of play. So if you would please throw your uh, thoughts and your congratulations in the chat for Ms. Lyda Lander's play, closes at nine, and our two actors, uh, Olivia Schindler and Katie Moran. Next, we're gonna move right into our next play and you're gonna finally get rid of me for a few minutes. Uh, we have our next play, which is going to be called Ludo, which was uh, created by our very own Chandra Watson, who was one of those graduating seniors. So congratulations to Chandra on her graduation yesterday. Uh, in her play, we have Miss Margot Boone, Jasmine Sims, uh, Olivia Schindler, subbing in for uh, Carrie Vidito, uh, Katie Moran, Corey Crow, subbing in for Marissa Burris, and Keelan Farrell. Scene one. Um, the interior of a cabin is present, the lights are dim, and the walls are wooden. A fireplace is found between the front door and a couch. A large coat peg is next to the door, and a coffee table is in the middle of the room. At rise, Eleanor is discovered sorting through cards, and there is a knock at the door. Thunder rings out, and Eleanor opens the door and gestures everyone through. Welcome, welcome. Come in. Get dry. Everyone enters wet hair and clothes from the rain. Towels? Eleanor gestures down a hallway. Thanks, I'm getting towels, everyone. This is nice. Kind of spooky, though. You think? That's kind of what I was going for. I asked for the one with the most ghosts. Rushing in with two towels, handing one to Leo and another to Maya. Pass them around. Two towels? It's just what hair. How many do you need? They pass around the towels and dry themselves. You brought a friend, didn't you, Maya? Gesturing to Beatrice. Yes, this is Beatrice. She doesn't talk, but you can talk to her. Well, very nice to meet you. We're going to be playing a little game, but your part's easy. Ooh, yes. I've always wanted to do one of the these things at those restaurants. How does it go again? Someone dies, and then everyone in the room has to find out who killed them. Millie nods. Thunder is heard, and the rain is louder. Shall we begin? Great. Here's the rundown. You're still yourselves, but I've made it interesting. Eleanor pulls five cards from her pockets and begins to hand them out flipped over around the room. These are your game cards. You can't flip them until the game officially starts. Now, I have an announcement. In this cabin, there has been a murder. But who's dead? Eleanor falls dramatically onto the couch into a coffin pose. Me. You can't kill yourself. I didn't. I've been murdered. Begin. They flip their cards over. Is this a joke? I don't understand. What's wrong? Do you have an issue of what, is, what it says, Millie? Maya? What does yours say? Millie hides her card. Nothing. It says nothing. I'm a bit confused too, L. It's a game. There are clues in every room. Find the murderer. But these cards... What about the cards, Maya? What's wrong with yours? How about you, Beatrice? How's your card? Beatrice shrugs nervously. Hers is fine. Play the game. Oh, I'm not sure what you're trying to pull here. Eleanor lays still and silent on the sofa. Okay, what do all our cards say? Well, what does yours say? How about we just play? There are clues in other rooms. Let's just figure it out. Scene two, the rooms are seen side by side, the office and the bathroom. The bathroom is empty and the lights have been dimmed. Maya and Beatrice are seen in the office searching for clues. This is weird, isn't it? What? The game. Everyone's card seems to have something weird. What does yours say? What does yours say? 
Maya avoids answering and Leo enters to search. Maya greets them and the lights in office dim as the bathroom lights get brighter. Millie is seen foraging through the cabinets for clues and Chloe enters. We Millie find anything yet? Nope, not yet. What's wrong? You're acting like this isn't kind of freaky. What's freaky is that whatever L put on your cards, you won't say, even though something's bothering everyone. Yours bothered you too. Maybe. Chloe begins to search for clues. Did you check the shower? I think I found something. She picks up a pregnancy test off the cabinet in the shower and Millie is taken aback. Oh God. What? Nothing. It has an M on the back. Maya got freaked out earlier and she was the first person to say anything. Are you saying Maya's pregnant, like in the game? We both know Eleanor didn't think of this stuff as a coincidence. There's no way you all would have all freaked out. She put real stuff. I think Maya's actually pregnant. Lights in the bathroom dim as the office lights rise. We see Leo searching for clues and Maya sitting on the floor with Beatrice. I don't understand what clues she'd leave. Maybe you'd find out if you helped look. Fine. Maya begins to forge through a small bookshelf. When she takes a book off, several pictures fall to the floor and she begins to pick them up before stopping. Leo, what are these? What? Photos of you. A bunch of photos of you at my dad's store. I don't understand. Leo grabs the stack of pictures from Maya and they stand face to face. Were you stealing? Scene three, we are back to the main cabin room where Eleanor is still laying down on the couch. Leo, Maya, and Beatrice enter from the office while Millie and Chloe enter from the bathroom. I can't believe you would steal from our store when you know about how much we struggle. You won't even let me explain. What's up, bun in the oven? What? Don't act dumb. One of the clues was a pregnancy test with, the M, with an M on the back. And you think I'm pregnant? I know you're pregnant. That's ridiculous. How is it that ridiculous? Yes. Eleanor's voice startles them. Ridiculous, Maya. Stop it, Elle. Tell them why it's so far-fetched of an idea for you to be pregnant. You're supposed to be the dead person. Stop talking. I'm also the host of the game. Tell them. What's on your card, Maya? Not another word from you either, shoplifter. Just tell us what's on your card. Tell them or I will. Everyone looks at Maya as she begins to speak before stopping. Okay then, everyone, Maya's- Hey. What? I'm gay. The room is silent for a moment. Gosh, Maya, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. Leo walks towards Eleanor. Elle, what the hell is wrong with you? Maya stops Leo from getting any closer. I don't need you sticking up for me. Do you understand how much money my family loses from stealing? What kind of selfish person are you? Hold on, someone's pregnant. Why do you care who's pregnant? Why do you care why I care? If the M on the back wasn't for Maya... Millie begins to cry. Oh God, Millie. Hold on, so you sat there just now? What? Maya puts the stack of pictures down on the coffee table where Leo picks them up. Maya then walks closer to Millie. You knew I wasn't the one pregnant, and then you sat there while I outed myself. Leo begins to shuffle through the pictures. I think we should all just calm down. Guys? How was I supposed to know what was going to happen? It doesn't matter what was going to happen. You still put it on me. Guys, why is there a picture of Chloe's boyfriend in here? (laughs) <laughs> you guys are killing me here. You're already dead. Leave us alone. What does Mark have to do with any of this? You guys forgot the juiciest part of every teen pregnancy. You've heard everyone enough, Eleanor. Don't you dare. The father. What are you saying? Well, there was no need to put two M's on the pregnancy test. <laughs> I'd just be repeating myself. Chloe crosses to Millie, who is still crying. Is it true? It was an accident. You slut! Chloe slaps Millie's face and then begins to grab at her before Leo restrains her. Okay, we all need to calm down right now. Calm down? It just got fun. Isn't that right, Beatrice? Leave her alone. She has nothing to do with whatever sick game you're making us play. 
Aww. I would never leave someone out. What does that mean? Make her explain. No, you can taunt us all you want, but she's done nothing. Look at her card. Can I please see it? Beatrice looks around nervously before handing her card to Maya. Maya takes a moment to read it. Oh God. Oh God. What is it? Maya's got a crush. You knew? This entire time you had this and you let me be humiliated humiliated in front of everyone? Beatrice stares back at Maya without saying anything and Maya begins to cry. We were alone in the room earlier. I you just gonna let me keep going? Do you have literally anything to say? Maya, oh, you're scaring her. Well, I've been scared this entire time. I needed my friend and she didn't even have the decency to tell me what that she knows about how I feel. We should have gone home a long time ago. Why, so you can get yourself knocked up by someone else's boyfriend? Stop it, she's right. We should have left when we knew something was up. I'm not leaving. Maya. No, I'm not leaving until I get an answer. An answer to what? You feel the same way? Maya, Elle got in our heads. She's trying to upset you. The poor girl can't even talk. We all need to leave. Both of you stay out of it. You've done enough to me. How come you still won't let me explain? No. No? <laughs> well, that's that. I'm serious. We all need to go home right now. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't you want to know who the murderer is? It was me. Well, now you've taken all the fun out of guessing. Let's just go, please. We all begin to awkwardly make their way towards the door and grab their things. As everyone begins to exit, Chloe stays behind and walks towards Eleanor, getting close to her face. You're a jerk. Eleanor stares back blankly at Chloe for a moment before Chloe exits. Eleanor speaks once Chloe is completely off stage. No. Curtain. All right, very good. Thank you guys for sharing that. And thank you, Shandra, for uh, bringing us your art. That was amazing. So one way for you as audience members to show your support is what a lot of you guys are doing right now is to type your comments in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking about what you're seeing uh, and, and, and say congratulations to all of our, our actors and our playwrights. Uh, I, I, they are really gonna appreciate seeing all of those uh, now and a little bit later as well. I'm also gonna do, for any of you guys that came in a little bit late, I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna throw the link to the um, uh, program for tonight in the chat so you can see uh, who is performing and the order of performance and, and all of that. So we are coming up to our third performance of the evening. Our next script is a script called Promise by our very own Corey Crow. In Promise, we have two very talented actors. We have Miss Sydney Harris and Mr. Kijani X. I am now so happy to announce that we are going to begin with Promise by Corey Crow. Scene one, setting. Old tattered window, a soft chevron blue couch, two gray chairs in the corner. It is seen as an older country style home it has a very Southern farmhouse feel to it. It, however, is very outdated. At rise, lights come up to see Ryder Lynn coming through the big window, trying to be as quiet as possible. Shit, this window, I swear. Carson walks out of Ryder Lynn's room wearing his varsity jacket. What the hell? Chill out, I had to move the ladder to get in. Looks her up and down and sees that she is wearing a short skirt and a nice shirt. Why are you wearing that? Why are you wearing that? Don't worry about it. Why are you coming in so late? I can ask you the same. So if you're not going to say, I'm not either. Fine. I went out with friends, you know, Alea and Graham. Hesitantly. Okay, I was at the party. I saw you. You did? 
How long were you there? Long enough. I thought you weren't gonna see her again. You broke your promise. Why? It's a long story, you wouldn't get it. Carson, you could have died that night. She is trouble. A, a wave of silence falls over the room. Whatever, I can't deal with this right now. Just go to bed and leave me alone. Scene two, setting. We're in the school building. We see lockers in the background and big double doors at the end of the hall. Kids are flooding the hallway. At rise, lights up. We see Ryder Lynn at her locker. Lots of kids are running and screaming in the hallway. Ryder Lynn. Carson enters to find Ryder Lynn at her locker. Hey, where did you go this morning? Here, Carson. I came here. We never got to talk about last night. Complete silence. Just, just let me explain. Better. She almost killed you, Carson. What excuse could you make for that? You don't know the full story. You don't even care enough to listen. Oh my God, I know you're not gonna talk to me about caring. Who was by your side the whole time you were in the hospital? Cause I'll give you a hint, it damn sure wasn't her. Ryder Lynn storms out. Scene three, setting. Old tattered window, blue chevron couch, two gray chairs in the corner. At rise, lights up. Carson is sitting in the chair waiting for Ryder Lynn to return home. On the phone. Oh yeah, that was crazy and I saw it in. She sees Carson yeah, in one of the great chairs waiting for her. Yeah, I'm gonna have to call you back. Hangs up phone. Can we please talk? Just listen, please. Ryder Lynn reluctantly sits down preparing for whatever might come next. I know you worry about me ever since that night, but I worry about her. You don't need to worry about her. You need to worry about you. What happened that night was her doing. She has a problem. She needs everyone to like her and I need you. She needs professional help. Not everyone is as lucky as you and I. We have each other. She doesn't have that. You and I, we have always been through everything together through the divorce. She has no one who cares for her the way that we care for each other. She's so alone, she needs someone. But not if it gets you killed, because everything you said was true. But when I saw that on the news, a car was going 102, I was so worried for the people in the crash. Then I got the call that my little brother was in the accident and that they didn't know if he would make it or not. Carson, that killed me. You're my brother, but you're also my best friend. And I don't know what I would have done if you had died. I know you're scared, but you're not gonna lose me. I know that night getting in her car was stupid. I know that, but it will not happen again. But I need to be there for her, like you are for me. Okay, I still don't like it. Something this time to make sure you can keep it. Promise me we'll always tell each other everything and that you will be careful. I cannot lose you. Promise. All right, very good guys, very good. Thank you for that. Now again, show your support there in the chat. That is the best way for you to show our playwrights and our actors that you appreciate the work that they have done. Uh, really quick before we move on to the next script, I want to uh, let you guys know kind of the process that we went through in creating this night, this event. Um, I asked all of my classes, I opened this up to anybody who wanted to do this, uh, to submit a script that they created, uh, be it in class, because we write some scripts in our classes, or if it's just a passion project, something that they had done on their own. Uh, and we had a bunch of great submissions, and you're seeing a bunch of them tonight. Uh, after that, we asked for volunteers for our actors and those that you're seeing acting tonight, performing in these roles, they volunteered and they were placed sort of where we thought uh, they would best fit. Uh, we've had about three rehearsals uh, between our playwrights and our actors, and now we're here. This is something that's it's really quick and it's really easy, but 
it's something that it, it really trains not only our playwrights to work as directors and to work with their own piece that of course they are very connected to and kind of give that up to a bunch of actors but it also helps our actors to learn how to you know create character and perform just on the fly so what you're seeing tonight is is the the product of only you know three four rehearsals all of which may have been half an hour uh, so all of this is just sheer you know uh, skill and sheer talent from our actors and our performers so just keep that in mind as, as we are moving forward and we are we have uh, three more scripts left to go. So next, I'm so happy to introduce uh, the opening scene from a play that Willie Bumgardner has been working on for class. That play is called Inner, and we're going to see a very short snippet of that today. Uh, playing uh, the part of Willie's script will be uh, Miss Sam Uchida. Soraya Lowry Matthews, Shiloh Hawkins, and Sarah Whitehead. Without further ado, here is the opening scene from Inner by Willie Baumgartner. All righty. The film opens. The screen is black. It abruptly cuts from the black, giving us a side view shot of a lake and a dock. Exterior, the lake. Night, colonial times. Text appears on screen. It tells us the year and place the scene takes place in. The scene the film is starting in. 1692, the colony. A tall, thin, brown-haired woman with sharply defined cheekbones runs to the edge of the dock, which leads to a vast body of water, the lake. She's clawing at her face almost, angry. However, she isn't all evil. As it is seen by her face that she has been crying a bit, she experiences human emotion. Colonial houses surround the dock and lake. Esmeralda is the woman's name. She's a witch. One that was good, but after something heinous became deranged by her own emotions. Another woman, a colonial woman, rushes behind. This woman is concerned. She's one who understands Esmeralda. One who knows what will happen if Ed Esmeralda goes through with what she's about to do. Esmeralda, wait. Esmeralda stops at the edge of the dock, angered, patronized. She turns around. No, they, they killed my children. Esmeralda, please. My blood will live in these waters, in this colony, until the day the sun doesn't come up. She pulls out a blade from her pocket. This won't be the last you see of me. She slits her throat falling back into the lake. The camera focusing on her blood as it splatters on the dock, giving the audience of a taste of the nightmare they're about to witness. The colonial woman's screams are heard in the background as the camera focuses on the blood-soaked wooden planks of the dock. Esmeralda's remaining blood flows through the waters, becoming tinted with red. Before completely dying, Esmeralda chants something. She dies. Despite being dead, she smiles. This is only the beginning. The scene changes into the inside of a pumpkin. Slice. A knife carves into the top of it. Interior, the kitchen, evening. This kitchen is rather modern, having some outdated technology. It's a, a student home. <clears throat> the technology being particularly an older microwave slash oven and an older storage for silverware. Text appears on screen. Introducing the new time period we're in, October 2019. A young, blonde-haired woman is the one carving the pumpkin. She has a stressed look on her face, as if she's using the current activity, carving the pumpkin, to suppress her emotions. A TV is faintly heard in the background. Also to suppress her emotions, the young, blonde-haired woman pulls out a vape, taking a hit of it. This young, blonde-haired woman is Millicent, a woman in her mid-20s, one who looks as though she grew up in a decent home with a put together functional family, almost like a high school sweetheart or a cheerleader. However, based on her expressions, mannerisms, and tendencies, Millicent is a woman of profound trauma. One who has been through thick and thin. One, there has been, one who's been through hell. She continues to carve in a circular motion around the top of the pumpkin, pulling the top off and setting it on the table. She sets the knife down. She picks up her phone, which also sat on the table, looking at the screen. 
She's texting someone, particularly a lover. Hey babe, um, I got us pumpkins. When will you be home? Florence, the texts read. No response. She sets it down, looking at the TV. It's a Halloween special of sorts. While it's not Halloween yet, the TV channel is just trying to get into the spirit. She sighs, picking up the remote and turning it off. Interior of the living room continued. Bang. The door slams open. A young, dirty, blonde-haired woman enters. She's frantic. On her head is a wound, a slice almost. Dried blood covers it. On her face are eyes opened wide. However, under her eyes are deep, dark bags. She hasn't slept in a while. She's also been in fear, stressing over something. This woman is Florence. Like Millicent, Florence is a woman of profound trauma. However, it is much more clear outwardly. Whereas Millicent seems more put together, Florence, like in this moment, allows her emotions to take control more easily. Millicent enters the room. Florence, where have you been? I, I've been worried sick. She notices the gash on her head where blood once trickled down her forehead but is now dried. Her tone quickly changes from startled and aggressive to worried. What happened to her girlfriend? Oh my God, your, your head. What happened to your head? Florence looks at Millicent for a moment, her face horrified. It, it's back. All these years, I've been living a lie. It's come back for me. I have to go. I have to stop it. Florence, thinking fast, runs over to a drawer in the living room. She opens it, digging around and pulling out cash. Atop the drawer on a dresser of sorts lies framed photos of Florence and Millicent, establishing their relationship as a couple. I, I don't understand. Millicent's tone changes for this next part of her line. She knows, or at least, or at least thinks she knows what is going on. Did you take your meds today? Florence looks at Millicent, confused, as if she's stupid. Why is she ignoring what she's saying? They're not gonna help. They can't stop this. She rushes to the front door. What the hell is going on? Florence looks up at her, her gaze horrified. M Millicent, I, I love you so much. You mean the world to me, but I have to go. Florence turns around toward the door, which is still wide open. Millicent grabs her by the arm. You are not going anywhere. Florence pulls her arm away. If I don't stop this, it won't stop. It'll come for those I love, you. It'll make you see things, things you wish you never saw. Millicent attempts to grab Florence by the arm once more, but before she can do so, Florence hesitantly slaps her. Millicent puts her hand on her cheek in shock. Florence quickly kisses her on her forehead. I love you, Millicent. Florence quickly, quickly runs out the door, slamming into Millicent's face. However, Millicent quickly grabs the doorknob, attempting to chase Florence. Exterior of the house continued. Their neighborhood is quaint, rural but suburban. Houses aligned, close together, each one decorated for Halloween. Nothing fancy, mainly cheap dollar store decorations and jack-o'-lanterns. Millicent stands on the porch, but she doesn't stop completely. She's ready to go if needed. Florence! Florence turns around. She stops for a moment, registering what she sees. She then screams, a tear falling, falling down her face. It's, it's already here. It's already coming for you. She turns around, running to the street. Millicent thinks for a moment, contemplating. She quickly makes up her mind, running back into the house, interior of the kitchen. Millicent walks down the hall for a moment, walking to the kitchen where her things lie on the table. As she walks to the kitchen, however, in the doorway, a woman is seen, one who hasn't been seen before. She vaguely resembles Millicent, as, as though she's the family member. This isn't acknowledged by the film, no sound effect. It's just there for the audience to register. M Millicent is faintly heard. It's, it's a woman calling her name. Millicent acknowledges the voice for a moment. She turns around, looking into the hallway. She recognizes the voice, but ignores it. She has to handle Florence. She grabs her purse, which sits on the kitchen table, and opens it. Digging around, she pulls out her keys. She then picks up her phone. She opens it, dialing 911 into the keypad. Millicent continues to diligently walk to the door as she uses her phone. 911, what's your emergency? My 
my girlfriend is having a manic episode. She just ran off. I'm worried for her safety. Millicent stops dead in her tracks. She drops her phone, her keys, and her purse. The contents of the purse spill onto the floor. Ma'am? She continues to stare, ignoring the 911 operator. The screen goes black. When returning, we're given a shot of the lake. It's bubbling. Esmeralda's powers are strong and bound within it. She caused this. The title appears on the screen. Enter. End scene. Yeah, very good, guys. Very good. <laughs> awesome. If you didn't see in the chat, I wanted to, to highlight really quickly again. Um, this is the opening scene of a script that Willie worked on for the majority, if not the entirety, of the first semester of this year and was probably sitting on it a little bit before then. Uh, it is a full, and, and I'm, I might get the page number, the exact page number, a little bit wrong, but uh, right at about 120 page feature length film. Um, yeah, Willie, go ahead. So I just, I, I wanted to kind of talk about it. I'll do like 30 seconds so we can have sure. time. But essentially I conceived the script in July of 2020. It was originally gonna be a short story, but I had a much bigger idea there. And then coming into this year, we had the advanced production design class. And before school started, I had a meeting with Mr. B saying, I wanna write this as a script. And that's what happened. Um, so from, August of 2020 to even now, because I'm still kind of revising it. Um, I've been working on this, this script. So yeah, that, that's all, that's, that's my two cents. I thought I'd just say a little something, something. But yeah. I, I figured you would. Awesome. Thank you, Willie. I so appreciate you letting us know about that. Um, I also want to highlight really quickly in case any of you guys uh, are interested, Olivia put this in the chat. If you have any questions or any thoughts specifically to any of our playwrights work, feel free to throw them in the chat. I'm sure that our playwrights would love to go back and take a look at those and answer any questions that you've got. Now let's move on to our penultimate script. Uh, this one is uh, a, a, a title that's in Latin that I'm going to attempt, <laughs> uh, but it is written by our very own Raina Williams. Uh, this script is called Ne Remus Post Mutationes, uh, which is uh, Latin. Uh, I want to welcome to uh, your screen our three actors, uh, Joshua Palma, Sydney Harris, and Amarian Legs. Now, because this is what it is, Amarian uh, is going to end up turning his camera off simply because we want the audio quality to be as good as possible. But you can see him there, and I want you all to congratulate him as well. He also graduated yesterday. And all of our graduates, all three that you've seen so far, they have taken the time out of their, their crazy post-graduation schedule to be here tonight uh, and to uh, give this performance to you. So um, I want to thank those people. I also want to introduce Olivia again, who's going to be reading stage directions uh, in place of Reina tonight. Uh, and without further ado, this is Ne Remus Post Mutationes by Reina Williams. I found out I was doing stage directions about 30 minutes ago, so I'm going to do my best to do this. We, we got this. All righty. <clears throat> Setting. We enter Kai's bedroom. It's very disheveled. Clothes are strewn all, strewn all over the floor. The closet is open with the laundry hamper turned over, spilling its contents onto the floor, and his shoes cover the remaining clear spots of the stained carpeting. At rise, as the lights slowly fade up, we see Kai sleeping soundly in no shirt and a pair of white Nike basketball shorts. We hear the birds chirping loudly outside his window and the faint honking of cars and school buses. We can even see a little sunlight peeking through the blinds of his window, which casts a shadow on his bedroom floor. Alarm clock blares noisily, reading 6.30. Ah. Hits the snooze button, in the process knocks glasses off the nightstand. What? Come on, man. This shit again, bro. Rolls out of bed under the clothes and shoes that swallow the carpeted floor beneath it. Good thing these johns aren't broken or my dad would kill me. Picking up his glasses and stumbling to his feet, smells under his arms. I don't stink. Maybe it's because I took a shower last night. I don't know, but let me throw these G-Fazos and the shirt on and I'll call it a day. Puts on a blue shirt, glasses, and matching blue Nike Air Force Ones to match the shirt. He runs down the stairs into the <laughs> kitchen, pops some toast in the toaster, and waits for it to be ready. Marlene enters. So, how was the game last night? It was so good, Ma. The Celtics won. 
Pause. Where's dad? I never really got to talk about the game with him. He fell asleep at halftime. Toaster pops up. I think he left for work earlier around 5.45 or 6. Her phone alarm blares in her pocket. The time reads 7 o'clock. Turning it off. I'm going to start the car. Grab your toast to go today. We've got to make it to Dr. Ralph's early. I'm tired of being late. Hugs Kai, then walks out the door. Yes, ma'am. Grabs the toast, then locks and closes the door. Lights slowly fade to black. Scene two, setting. The doctor's office is painted sky blue with airplane photos lining the walls. In the corner of the room, there are a couple of red chairs and a smart board. At rise, lights fade up, displaying Kai on a doctor's table, his legs hanging off the side. Kai has an IV in his arm, which is hooked to several clear bags. Hey, yo, I forgot to get to skip English today. Starts celebratory dancing to himself. Dr. Ralford and Marlene enter, sit on the red chairs, and talk, whispering. So, how's he doing, Doc? He's going so well. The cancer is progressively getting better as he lives and breathes. That's good. Excitedly. Why, it's amazing. I haven't ever seen anyone's cancer cells die as fast as your son's. Turning his head to them. So, does that mean I'm cured? Well, not cured, but you're getting there. If we continue this little routine we have of you coming here every morning and getting your IV meds, excuse my language, but we'll make this cancer hour. Ralph! What is the truth? Pause. Kai, do you want an action figure for beating that cancer like a champ? Yes, please. Leaves the room. Marlene, I ran a couple of extra tests to make sure I was right about the cancer going away. The hereditary genetic exam came back with a positive. Not for cancer, though. It was positive for the MAOA gene, the warrior gene, the serial killer gene. Marlene gasps. This could mean nothing, or it could change everything. After two seconds, immediate blackout. Scene three, setting. The scene is dark and the environment is tense. Sirens blare noisily and the street lamps from outside the window flicker on and off without end. The night is intense with winds that rustle leaves and knock over occasional trash cans. At rise, as lights fade up to a dim blackout, we see Kai sleeping. He snores some here and there until suddenly, abrupt green flash outside of window, tossing back and forth. Huh? What, what is it? What do you want? Sits up suddenly, looking around his room. Huh, what, what happened? Rubbing his temples, realizing he has a massive migraine. Ah, uh, damn, my head, it's pounding. What the hell is going on? Close, closes his eyes, rubbing them. A scene vividly plays out in his mind while he rubs his eyes. There's a blue uh, light put on stage right, Kai's bedroom. Stage left uh, fades up slowly with this light red gel hitting the psych. He sees a woman crying and shivering in the right corner, crying, no, Malcolm, not Tassie, anyone but her. Then the scene shifts to the left, revealing a man raising a snake knife to a young girl he has pinned over a kitchen table. The man looked at the girl straight in the eyes, plunged the knife through her chest, and smiled. Stage left lights fade out. Kai opens his eyes. Stage right spot fades up. Red gel swells on psych. Pause. Kai gets a glazy red look in his eyes. That type of violence. Aggression, that power, that, that control. I want that. No, I, I need that. Puts on a hoodie from off, his, off of his floor, runs downstairs into the kitchen and out the door. The red gel covers the psych. The right spot fades out. A woman shrieks. Red gel fades, leaving only the road noises and blackness. The end. Very good. All right, thank you guys. Throw your thoughts and comments there in the chat for Raina Williams' script. Uh, she did a phenomenal job with that one. As we come up to our final script of the evening, I just once again want to thank you guys for coming out. Um, do know that this is currently being recorded. Uh, and while we are going to still kind of figure out exactly where we're going to put the recording, I know one place that we will definitely put it is on our very new uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. It's just called NSA Theater Conservatory, I believe. 
so uh, probably tomorrow afternoon, once I'm able to, you know, get to it, I'll get that up on our YouTube channel. So you can, if you have anyone who uh, was unable to attend tonight, who would like to go back and watch these performances, they'll be able to see it there. And we may end up trying to uh, link it in our uh, Instagram, as well as our Facebook and things like that. So there are plenty of ways for you to see this if you did not get the chance to do so today. Okay? Now I want to introduce our very final script of the evening. This is a script that was co-written by Miss Nayla Maple and Miss Raina Williams. Uh, this script is called Stuck Seeing Reality, and it features uh, a few of the actors that you've seen already and a few that you haven't seen yet today. Uh, please join me, Kijani X, Zoe Facig, Charlene Baleda, Kiki Farrell, and Amarian Legs. Again, uh, Amarian will most likely say hello, and then he'll throw his camera off just for the audio quality. So without further ado, here is Stuck Seeing Reality by Nayla Maple and Raina Williams. All right, scene one, setting. It's midday, the night before everyone was forced to stay inside their home. Center stage, there is a family couch in the middle of the living room. At Rice, Kane walks on stage right. Kane enters stage right with a duffel bag. What's up, gringos? Jennifer enters left. Mother Gringo. Hey Kane, you finally came to see your parents. You're back from, where are you from again? Goes to sit on couch. You know, mom, details like that don't even matter, okay? All right, son. Kids, a key come to the living room. Your Gringo is here. A key walks in left. Hello, my son. How? Michael and Guy walk in left, slamming the door behind them. Oh, um, your siblings are here. So I heard from the door slam. Oh, well, look what the cat dragged in. Oh, shut up, Michael. Michael sits on the couch. How have you been? You know, here and there, living life to the fullest, or as much as I can, being unemployed and all. Nice, son. That's really nice, son. Half, son. <clears throat> oh, and what have you been doing with your life, half-blood? Well, I'm on Broadway, actually. You should come and see how real adults live their lives. OMG, that's so good for you. Can anyone who cares raise their hand? Oh, wow, no one raised their hand. Surprising. And um, when did you get on Broadway? Because last I checked, you were barely making it with food in your casa. It's been years since you all have been in the same room or even talked to each other. Maybe you guys should catch each other up. Yes, that is exactly no, what I'm going to do. Family weekend. I think that's a great idea, Papa. Oh, hell no. You are not about to make me stay yeah. here. I was forced to stay here for 18 years with these gringos. Can you stop saying that? You are not about to make me stay here again. A queen has to live her life. <laughs> Kane storms off left. I'm going to my room. Michael walks off left. Um, I'm gonna go ahead to my room too. Good night. Di walks off left. Do you think it was me? I mean, do you think I was wrong the way I raised them? They never, they never really got along like siblings. I should have forced them to get along. <laughs> yeah, okay. Do that and make the problem worse. Listen, honey, you... We can't make them get along. We can only pray that God brings them together as a family. Well, I guess you're right. I love you. I love you too. They both start to walk off left. And listen, if they never get along, we can always have more kids and start over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I am suddenly deaf. Honey, huh? What did you say? They both walk off left. Scene two, setting. The next morning in the living room. At rise, Jennifer is sitting on the couch with her pajamas and sipping on a cup of coffee, scrolling through the television that is, that is not seen but heard. And so with everything shut down because of the virus, the president is urging individuals to stay, to, to stay inside their homes. Kane walks on left until extraordinarily measures are taken. Well, that's not exactly what I oh, meant, no. God. <laughs> oh, Jesus, say it ain't true. Everyone comes flooding on stage and Kane looks at them in disgust. <laughs> no. Wrong. Yeah, what's wrong? Yeah, what's wrong now? Because there's always something wrong. You should watch your tone with me since you know that we'll be stuck together in this house for God knows how long. What? Yeah, the government said it this morning. <laughs> the house until further instructions. My life. My career. My school. I'm sorry, but did you just say my career? <laughs> and did you just say my life? Oh, please. Both of you, I've had it. I've had it the hardest out of all of us. Oh, please. In line us all with why your life is so much harder than ours. Everyone, please get your popcorn because the middle child queen is speaking. Did you know I was in law school? <laughs> Did you know that I'm struggling to get through it and living on my friend's couch? I can't find a job to pay enough to give me enough money for the entrance fee for the bar exam. So yeah, I think I drew the short end of the stick on this one. Michael and Kane's faces change to empathize with Di. Anyways, you guys are so in yourself so you don't even realize that people around you actually care about you. Hold on, let me stop you right there, princess. I've been going through life without anyone to care about me, ever. I have no job and nowhere to live. You guys had it the best, both of you. So I don't wanna hear either of you complaining about struggles and rejection because trust me, I know how that feels. We had it the best? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Acting was no, <laughs> is my only income. Without it, what am I? I would kill to have a life like yours, Kane. not a care in the world, just living life to the fullest without restraints, free. And yours, Di, you may not have all the money in the world, but at least you're trying to get there. You're almost a lawyer for goodness sake. You know what I think? <coughs> Crazy, we're all arguing like this. You guys are literally I'm all sorry. in troubles. Finally, someone said it. Children, you need to stop arguing with each other about whose life is worse or better. You all need to face the realization that life is not always just about you. All of you have lives. Small, yes, but important in their own unique ways. All of you sit. The kids sit down on the couch. Now that you're all stuck in this house together, you can now see what is reality and what isn't. I can tell you right now, thinking you are the only person in the world is not reality. That's just being selfish. Look at yourselves, stop arguing about whose life is more important. Di is right. That's a first. Jennifer glares at Kane. Sorry. All of you need to apologize to each other and realize that we are all a family half-bloods and gringos and all. Now, I am going to make dinner when you all come to the kitchen. I want you all to be a family with your hands washed. Walks off left. You all better be a family when you leave this room or I'm going to hear about you later. <laughs> you know how sure. you to get here. Walks off left. All right, I'm sorry. Look, mom is right. We're all family. I mean, we have to be. We all came back home at the same time. No one asked us to be here. We all came back because deep down, we all know we still love each other and love and care about each other. <laughs> oh, I only came back because I knew me mother would be cooking. Speaking of that, can we all go eat, please? All three kids start to walk off left. Kane stops Michael. You know, big bro, you never said sorry. Sorry about the argument or that the world will never accept you for who you truly are? Both. 
Everyone walks off, but Kane stays on stage smiling. B, Kane walks off left. <laughs> All right, very good, my friends. Thank you for uh, giving us your art. I so appreciate that. That was our final script of the evening. So I want to thank all of you guys for coming. And I want to ask that all of my performers and playwrights join me. Let's see all of your faces here. Uh, join me here on the screen. You can see all of the awesome people that had the chance to uh, perform for you and share their art with you. I mean, look at all these people. Aren't they awesome? So if you uh, we'll take a second and, and throw your praises into the chat uh, for all of our amazing performers and playwrights and everybody who made this happen tonight. Um, I do want to, before I, I let you go completely, I want to turn it over to uh, Olivia to make a quick announcement that's uh, thespian related about the end of the year, and then we will finish this up. Hello guys. So before I say something a little heartfelt, um, I want to talk about our fine, final Thespian uh, uh, Honor Society sponsored event, which is our drive-in, which not a lot of people have actually heard about. So you guys might be the first to really know about it, but uh, let me just make sure I have all this information right. Next Tuesday uh, at 8 p.m., Tuesday, May 25th, which is I'm pretty sure the last day of school, we are sponsoring a drive-in at NSA, which is across from the theater greenhouse uh, on NSA's campus. There's gonna be lots of directions to guide you to where to go, but we are gonna be playing School of Rock for like a final end of year movie, super fun, Jack Black, Miranda Cosgrove, all the good actors in there. Who doesn't love Jack Black, okay? Um, but we really hope to see you guys there. It's going to be super fun. You can watch School of Rock and it's free, but we are going to be, it's free admission, but we are going to be accepting donations because we haven't been able to, you know, like raise money as we would like to this year for our honor society. But bring your own food, bring your own drink. We can't really sell those because of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, that's going to be our kind of last event we're going to be doing throughout the year. And then lastly, I like to finally say, to my actors, to the people in the audience. Thank you. Thank you for a great year. It has been, it's um, not as I expected. Oh, another person hopping on the mic, fun. Um, uh, it's definitely not what I expected uh, as the student president, but hey, we made the most of it and we did some fun activities we didn't think we'd be able to do. Um, I'm so glad I got to meet some of the new freshmen this year and I guess, make sure I'm still involved because I love you guys. Um, I'm not going to cry. I'm, I'm, I'm a big girl. Um, you guys so much for this year. I don't really have anything else to say. I'm going to pass it over to Mr. B, but again, thank you so much. Thank you, Olivia. I so appreciate you saying all of that. So uh, don't forget next Tuesday, School of Rock, uh, it is, we, we initially called it a drive-in. What we're gonna do instead is it's gonna be uh, kind of like a, a, a movie night in a park sort of thing. So uh, we'll have much more information on our Instagram page. Um, if you want to follow us at NSA Theater Conservatory on, uh, uh, on Instagram, uh, you'll be able to get all of the information about that uh, here very, very shortly, because it's coming up here pretty soon. Like Olivia said, um, it is completely free. There's no charge for you to come in. Do know that we will, will not be selling any kind of concessions. We will not be selling uh, anything like that. And also, and this is sort of the most unfortunate part of this, we aren't actually gonna be able to offer uh, restrooms because unless you are an NSA student or faculty, you are not allowed in our buildings still. Uh, hopefully that will change very soon. However, uh, do know that that is something to consider when thinking about coming to this event. Um, Please, please, please consider coming. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, bring uh, blankets to sit on, uh, lawn chairs to sit on, things like that. It's gonna be a really, really cool thing. So bring your friends, bring your family, come watch School of Rock with us really quickly. Uh, and check out our Instagram at NSA Theater Conservatory for more information here very, very soon. I wanna say thank you for all of our performers, all of our playwrights, and I wanna say thank you for all of you for attending. Uh, if you have any other comments you wanna throw in the chat, now is the time to do that, otherwise, I am going to allow all of our uh, participants today to give you a big goodbye and we will see you again soon. And we will definitely see you at NSA on the Roxy stage 
next year. So get ready for that, especially those guys who haven't had the chance to do that yet. So thank you so much. Have a great night and uh, hope to see you next Tuesday. Wow. Oh my gosh, everyone did so good. I'm getting a little oh, emotional. Oh, I was a little emotional. Olivia, you made